Hi, and welcome to the Punk CX podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsko, and I'm an advisor, best-selling author, speaker, and general explorer when it comes to customer and employee experience. I'm really interested in figuring out what it takes to build organizations that produce better outcomes for both customers and employees. So with that in mind, I seek out and interview CEOs, entrepreneurs, business and tech leaders, authors and academics to uncover some clues about what it takes to build this, such an organization. Now, some of you may know the podcast as the Rare Business Podcast, but I decided to rename and rebrand the podcast recently. This is for a number of reasons. First one was to mirror the title of my book, Punk CX, which was published in June 2019. Two, because I'm a fan of punk music. And three, it's just more fun, right? If this is your first time listening to one of these interviews, then hello and welcome. Please do dive into the archives at adrianswinsko.com as I've now completed over 300 of these interviews in the last few years. If this is not your first time listening, then welcome back and thank you. So welcome to the next edition of the Punk CX podcast. With me today, I have a fellow with a very, very famous name in the UK, if he was from the UK, but he's not. And he's called Andy Murray. And he's not the Andy Murray, but he is the Andy Murray, if you know what I mean, because he's his own man. And he is the founder and executive chair of the Customer Centric Leadership Initiative at Sam M. Walton College of Business at the University of Arkansas, amongst many other things, which you'll tell us about in a minute. But I just want to say, hey, Andy, welcome to the podcast. And how you doing? Hey, Adrian. Thanks for having me on. You know, it's so funny. Uh, I was four years in the UK, and when I got there, I didn't realize how famous the word Andy Murray was. But <laughs> uh, it, it's uh, I had so many free hotel upgrades, you have no idea. And awesome. that worked out in my favor. But in everywhere I went, I was a slight disappointment. But... Uh, and, and, but <laughs> <laughs> Can we have a match? You're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I was like, oh, it's you. It's not. It's not the Andy Murray. Uh, but yeah. It. <laughs> uh, so it's it's quite it, in the U.S. It's not a thing, but over there it was quite fun. So, yeah. Uh, so, can you ahead. tell us? I mean, Andy, I know you've got you've done, you do the the executive chair thing and mm-hmm. the college of business, uh, but you do a bunch mm-hmm. of other things. I mean, can you for our listeners and and readers of the highlights? I mean, can you fill us in a bit about and Andy Murray and kind of what you what you do, what you're up to, what you, what you focus on, all that sort of stuff. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, Really at the core of what I do, I think, is help agile leaders be more successful at what I call or we call blue ocean type initiatives. And that's Mm -hmm. really framed um, what I've been doing now and a bit of what my career has been about. So 10 years at Procter uh, and Gamble, which landed the last year in the world of Walmart, uh, calling on Walmart. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was uh, quite a great journey of seeing that happen back in 1990 of the the relationship between P and G and Walmart, uh, they were real game changers in in coming up with a new way to do uh, supplier retail partnering, mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, launched an agency from scratch to take advantage of what was becoming, I think, uh, a, a massive media channel. If you look at Walmart with over a hundred million shoppers a week at that time, and wow. Procter was looking at it saying, you know, this is bigger than any media channel we're advertising. There's got to be something in here somewhere. So started down a journey of creating an agency focused on what was one of the early terms of shopper marketing, which I think is much more about customer journey work, uh, as you would call it today. Sure. Uh, and did that for several years, uh, grew it, and um, became uh, acquired by Saatchi and opened up uh, the shopper marketing practice uh, in 22 countries around the world up until about 2012. Mm. Uh, and then decided for some reason that I was going to retire, and it, that lasted a couple of weeks, uh, <laughs> and started again, and ended up actually uh, at Walmart uh, for about six years, and the uh, marketing creative side, uh, f- two years in the U.S., and then four years in the U- lovely U.K. as chief customer officer. Uh, in March, at ASTA, yeah, that's right. And so that was a great experience, and we'll talk more about that. Um, mm. But then, uh, it, all through that journey, uh, in the agency days, uh, there was always a blue a blue ocean opportunity in front of you. You were always looking at uh, how do you bring new value and new value propositions to your clients. That's what you're paid to do, basically. You're not sure. really paid to optimize scale. Um, 
yet in the corporate side, it's to the opposite. And so it was a much harder but more rewarding when uh, I could take some of those principles of entrepreneurship and uh, getting really close to the customer journey and bring it to fresh new value propositions. So that's what I wanted to do when I left uh, left ASDA and came back as a second attempt to retire uh, in mm-hmm. Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, to start Big Quest, which is really about, like I said, uh, using some method mindset and uh, some of the motivation be- behind how you take on bigger initiatives in more uncertain blue ocean type territories where you're not leveraging scaling incrementality and those kind of things. Um, And one of the first phone calls I took, I I had was with the Dean of the business school, uh, Walton College, because I had been working with them over 20 years uh, with their Center for Retail Excellence. And I just asked him, you know, what are you you working on? And uh, he asked me what I was working on. I told him a little bit about BigQuest and he's like, I want one of those uh, for the Walton College of Business because he had been on a mission to drive um, more awareness about what the college was doing and he had done a great job getting him number one ranked in the US uh, for the um, the product supply logistics uh, practice area discipline and thought marketing could be that too. But marketing he saw as a red ocean and he thinks the links would be in the blue ocean. So we had a conversation said, actually, uh, Dean Waller, the, the, the marketing space is is a total blue ocean right now because it's getting reinvented by customer centric type thinking. And sure. what and the question I put forward to him was, you know, why is it that probably on the nightstand of most Fortune 500 CMOs is a book by a professor? Uh, that book is How Brands Grow and the professor is Byron Sharp and he yeah. does a great job of that. But should there be a book on the nightstand nightstands of Fortune 500 CMOs that talks about how to how to drive growth through customer centric type leadership because mm-hmm. that's a broader topic than marketing and uh, you really experience that in the UK for some reason the UK has been on a customer journey I think a little bit longer and it's not uncommon to see in top retailers or brands a chief customer officer where in the US that's fairly rare mm-hmm. and marketing doesn't doesn't do that. I think the UK is probably four or five years ahead. You think? Uh, and so that's a passion area of mine. And um, and he uh, he thought as well that that's something that university should really rethink. So we started the customer centric leadership initiative. Right. And the goal of that is to basically bring more conversation between faculty, students, uh, thought leaders in the industry like yourself, Adrian, and practitioners to bring a bit more common understanding about what does it mean to be a customer-centric organization. Can, uh, I, lots stop, of, can I stop you yeah. there? Because actually that's kind of the really thing, because I think that the, this is a really interesting kind of topic. I mean, yeah. and I want to go right to the heart of it. It's like, tell yep. me what you think, or what's your view, or what's an emerging kind of view of around, what is customer-centric? What is a customer-centric organization? Well, it's, it's a great question, and I don't think there's really, um, uh, an official definition anywhere, just like there wasn't one for shopper marketing back in the day. But I, I my personal view, uh, mm. Adrian, is that it's it's a combination of mindset and method and motivation that puts the wants and desires of the customer mm. at the center of all decision making that impacts the customer experience. Yeah. Okay. And it's about harmonizing. I think it's about harmonizing three things: technology, human design, and agile. Right. Okay. And. Then if you take it down from the organization kind of level, because you then talk about you're talking mm-hmm. about customer centric leadership initiative, what does it mean for leaders and kind of leadership? I mean we're not and we're not just talking at the kind of the board level leadership as well. You know, we're talking about at all levels, right? Yeah, more so it's about helping understand it uh this area from a leadership perspective because okay. people that have grown up in customer experience practice areas uh, or on dot com or pure plays this is uh, really second nature work right and yet when you get into senior leadership or mid level up many have never worked in an agile environment mm. they think agile means velocity right uh, they they don't understand that it's a scientific method and how it has to change and so there's a lot of misperceptions at the senior level about how you operate and lead and what the expectations should be and not just you know if you think about customer centricity i'm also covering areas like What's the role of big data, uh, mm-hmm. customer data, uh, looking at, at analytics and AI, 
boy, that that whole area from a senior level level is well is pretty misunderstood. Very mm-hmm. high expectations and promises of unicorns and and pots of gold at the end of those rainbows. But but to actually lead in that environment when you know you need to be there and doing it, but you don't really understand it. And I, I, so for me, it's it's probably bringing a level of understanding up across different stakeholders. And so. Uh, what I've done is like a fifth, interviewed over 15 different thought leaders already, uh, like Dr. Nick Fine, uh, who mm-hmm. at Emergent was Emergent to to bring that perspective forward. Even guys like Paco Underhill, who have been in the behavioral observation space, yeah, for years. Um, you know, how is this? How is his work changing? And you know, what's the role of behavioral economics, neuroscience? How is that now entering into the space? And and for a typical CMO. I mean, they, they've not really had to wrap their heads around all of the different broader variables. Sure. And and is there a, um, an objective or a potential kind of series of outcomes or outputs and stuff around this kind of work? I mean, because they say it's an initiative, which sort of implies a direction, if you like. Yeah, we're, we're in the nascent early stages and we do, uh, right now we don't even have a body of work that right. would be some shared definitions, best resources, how to think about that. So uh, an LMS, if you want to think about that way for sure. faculty, begin teaching differently. Uh, so we're doing um, some of some customer experience type work. We're creating personas of the different mm-hmm. stakeholders. So what do the students think it is? What's the student experience? Mm-hmm. And how is how do they think about it if they're a customer of the university? Uh, so we're putting that into play as well. Uh, but it's, it's a bit about content creation now so that we can, and uh, go out and listen. And, right. and you know, the first, first real job of a customer experience person is to go listen to the customer and really understand the problem. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what we're trying to do now, and that's what we're in the early stages of. Awesome. So I've been through your I've been through your podcast has been quite helpful actually to uh, hear all of the, of the great guests talk about their definitions and I've followed up with many of that to um, to to pull in insights about how different groups are defining it. I'm, I'm I don't know if about you but I'm quite surprised about how much commonality there are there is in the challenges yeah. and in the issues. I mean it's just uh, I read your article um, on the. Uh, uh, what happens when you emerge from the pandemic and the four imperatives. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, uh, this, every single one of those so resonated with me. Awesome. I mean, let's kind of like, um, like, uh, thank you for that. And I, I want to get to that in a minute, but I think if I want to go back a little bit, because it's like, so you've just started recently, mm-hmm. I think it was the big, is it the beginning yeah. of the year that you started at the at the, um, at the business school? Is it, or the business uh, college? No, actually, actually it was in uh, the end of April. End of April, right? So you're right in the thick of it, yeah. Right? And you're coming in with some sort of views around what is required and stuff, and then this kind of virus thing, pandemic, mm. kind of like changed a yes. lot, right? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, has it, has the last few months and what's happened and the impact on leadership? Has it, uh, you know, has it changed your perspective or has it added things or kind of like what's how has the last few months been for you and kind of in, and, and, and its impact on your thinking? Well, it's um, it's not really impacted me personally from a well, of course, it is has in terms of social and all of sure. those kind of things. But I, I needed to be a bit heads down uh, working through a framework and all of that anyway. So it, it, it I probably would have found myself in the same situation. But one of my observations from uh, talking to so many different leaders that validated for me what I felt uh, all along in that uh, as senior leadership team, and I was on the exec um, board at, at ASDA, uh, we, we were working on a lot of big objectives to continue to try to transform the company. Right. And you know when you've got seven or eight objectives and you're trying to move them all forward, uh, it's not the same as having one objective. <laughs> and yeah. I think the pandemic brought everybody into focus in the seeing the power and speed. I mean, ASDA accelerated their e-commerce roadmap by eight years and eight weeks. Yeah, and it's um, amazing, and so, right? As amazing, and so so what I'm hoping, uh, my observation is the power of focus, mm-hmm. and uh, we can go much further faster when we whittle those uh, top priorities down to the things that are really essential, and yeah. I think that is, that's that's a key piece of it. Absolutely. Now you can also alluded to the the um, this the, the article that I wrote. It was back in mm-hmm. July, and, and I kind of like spent a I kind of toyed around with this kind of idea about things that I was seeing kind of change as tectonic mm-hmm. plates move, as it were. Yep. And I thought about kind of doing it as a series of articles, 
and that didn't seem to quite fit kind of like yeah. in four separate pieces so i ended up birthing this kind of like monster which turned into <laughs> a bit of an essay um <laughs> And you've kind of like seen it and, and things, and, and yeah. but I just wanted to get your reflection on kind of like the one. Do you you know you said you, you there's some of those or many of those kind of like themes of these imperatives landed with you, but do you, have you seen additional ones or are, you know are just or nuances on the ones that I identified or I mean it'd yeah. be great to get your take on that. Yeah. I, yes. Um, I do think that uh, fundamentally, probably for the last fifty years leaders that excelled were really good at optimizing scale and right. working in an, on incrementality, if you will, because, mm -hmm. cause, you know, a left brain leader, uh, the, the, when you run against a problem, the last thing you wanna do is look for creative solutions. The first thing you look for is, oh, I've seen that before, it's a proven answer, let me just right. go do that, because you're, you're trying to get achievement quickly. Mm -hmm. but, but, and it's almost been a bias against creativity. Yeah. And if you are a right brain leader, uh, you got exiled to the island of misfit toys, and and probably not promoted yeah. <laughs> because you're you know doing these odd new things. And I think what's changing, and and I think you hit on this a little bit in your in your article, is the there's going to be a higher demand for right brain leaders. And I, and I think a right brain leader is a little different than just a right brain thinker. Yeah. But a person that can lead with the right brain because the things that you're going to pull out of your memory bank to go execute against aren't going to work. I mean, mm -hmm. it's going to take new new things. And I think that's um, that's an important uh, important distinction, and we've not been trained uh, as real and promoted as right brain leaders. And I think the kind of the, in it because the thing that really kind of like um, the, I think I thought the kind of the, 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 all the different sort of I feel like imperatives. I mean, the learning, the resilience, protection, and mm -hmm. then the, the the experience and how that broke down into both customer and employee, and then stakeholder, and then the final one that some just kind of seemed to pop it was a bit like was this leader experience that's thing. That's right. And I just thought, and that sort of links back to kind of like what you're saying is like, this seems to be an area that we need to really look hard at because we make some big assumptions about leadership and capability. Mm -hmm. And we've that's been put under massive stress over yes. the last kind of few months. So yeah. is, is that something that you think that we kind of like, it needs to become a, an, an area of scrutiny of in itself? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I feel I feel like the leaders that have been leading through this have been showing a lot of courage, a lot of uh, resilience, and um, I, it's there is a bit of a separation I see between you know some really great leaders and those that uh, may need a lot more work. Right. Uh, that's that that gap has been exp has been very much exposed. Yeah. Through this, and so you you do see that uh, I think and. The, I, I'll go back to this point. I, I do think that um, it's causing leaders to think about having a different kind of mindset. And you talk about mindset, but yeah. there is a mindset shift that leadership are, are going through. And I think it's because we're being pulled into spaces where we can't rely on what we've done in the past. Mm. And you really do have to look for how to be successful in, in the space of uncertainty. And we're just not, we don't like uncertainty. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're not comfortable with it, but that's the big stress point, I think, for a lot of leaders that yeah. have, is the inability to, or not really de developed or supported in a way that makes them great in uncertainty. You know, I think it's fascinating because I think you're absolutely right. I mean, because if we, you know, um, political affinities aside, you know, if you look around the world at the leaders that in, in the eyes of their publics, as it were, mm -hmm. have responded best uh, or fared the best in this in this of the last few months. It seems to me that it's been the leaders that have been open and kind of honest with um, yeah. with their with their 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 the nation yeah. their nations that they're 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 trying to guide. Um, yeah. And when they don't know the answer, they've gone look. Well, we don't know the answer, but we'll go and find out. And we're working really hard and we'll keep you updated and some things might not work and so on and so forth. So it's a really honest and vulnerable sort of thing, but which is sort of almost not what you would normally expect in a time of a crisis. You want almost like certainty in time of a crisis, but maybe mm -hmm. the, the certainty with a little bit of variability and honesty and openness and transparency is, is these are new additions to that sort of certainty frame, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that's so true. And so often when you're in a leading change, if change is a bit like responding to a crisis, 
uh, leaders, uh, senior leaders work really hard to draft the message points and mm. make sure everybody's on the same song sheet. Uh, but that's just not, it's just not possible in this. And so you have to move to a different kind of space. I do think it's going to help. I do think it's going to help with uh, something that's very important to customer centricity, and that's empathy. Yeah. Uh, you, you almost um, have to be super empathetic with your team. And if you're not if you're not a very empathetic person, you probably are by now, yeah. uh, because of what's what's happened. And, and empathy, I think, is such an important attribute or character trait, however you want to call it, to to even you know get close to taking your company closer to the customer. It, it, and, you know, but I think it tells you that the um, there's there's a difference between talking about empathy and um, and actually kind of almost putting that into practice. I mean, um, yeah. <laughs> I just saw a circular from a, a major management publication just today about one of the latest articles mm. uh, that they published. And the, the title of the article was How to Think Like Your Customers. Mm. And that was a bit like, oh my God, that tells you everything you need to know. You know, in terms <laughs> of kind of the, inst- it's like an instruction manual. And you look at it, you go, that, you know, for somebody to have written that shows you that there is a there's a, a gap. Massive, there's a massive gap, right? It, yeah. You're like, I, I, I was horrified when I saw the, the head. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my like, gosh. Oh, really? I was like, my God. Yeah. <laughs> there must be a need for it, right? If somebody's written it. Uh, it's almost like if you read, saw an argument said, how do you how do you listen to your team? Well, you should. That should be kind of table stakes. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that shouldn't be new news. <laughs> Oh, yeah. that's great! No, and so I don't want to kind of name the publication because, well, mm. that's not that's not my business. Mm. Um, but I tell you what, can you give me a? Because you'll have been, you're, I mean, you're a yeah. keen observer of all this sort of stuff. I mean, do, have you got a couple of examples of, of like, say, because you mentioned there's a firms and leaders that have mm-hmm. really excelled and they've kind of they, they're almost accelerating away. Um, have you got a couple of examples that you could share with us that you think actually epitomize kind of what this customer centric leadership is and what you've seen and why they kind of sort of deserve that kind of the mantle, as it were? Just to yeah, bring it to you know, life. That's, you know? that's a super that's a super great question, I think, because if we can learn from examples and one that uh, a person I talked to yesterday actually, okay. uh, Sarah, Sarah Fryer, uh, she is the CEO of Nextdoor. And the next door, you know, you're familiar with that app, uh-huh. uh, very hyper local app for neighborhoods. And uh, we were talking about her journey through the pandemic and how it's changed and the things she had to work through. And boy, you know, she really <coughs> lives what's it mean to be customer centric. Uh, I mean, Sarah's got uh, a you know, degree from Oxford, mm-hmm. uh, super intelligent in mathematics and engineering and could really, you know, talk talk you through, was it uh, was it, uh, Square, N- knows the, the data and science and technology part, but, yeah. but spends a lot of her time out with customers, sharing customer stories, putting a customer's face to everything. Uh, her board report, it was all stories of every chapter starts with a story of a customer. Mm. And that level of empath- empathy and clarity around staying so close to that was was super impressive. And one of the things that um, they did that I thought was really fascinating was um, they she created, or their team created, a kindness reminder which uh, okay. uh, it's it's really interesting. So if you if you go into the the neighborhood, you know, into your neighborhood on the app, and you start making a post because you can co-create and you create content for for the, the your neighborhood to see. Mm-hmm. And if you start writing uh, something that's really negative, right, and and bad, and, and of course you know what we've been through with all the social unrest and yeah, yeah. politics and such. That's that's pretty tempting to do. Uh, there is a, I don't know if it's some kind of AI, but it, it, there's a pop-up comes up and says, hey, um, this is sounding like it might not be so kind. Uh, do you might ah, want to think this about- like kind uh, of proactive sentiment analysis. Exactly. That's super then, cool. <laughs> it is super cool. And then, and she said, there's a very high percentage of people will, will go back and edit that and re-edit that and then post it. And there's only a very small percentage that just like kill it and don't post it all. And there's a small percentage that just posted anyway, but right. but it really made a difference by just reminding people about kindness. Mm. And and I thought that was one of the best uses of technology at this time. And, and I also asked, could I get that on my work email? <laughs> 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 I mean, how, how how handy would that be for work? You know, I mean, but before you hit send, a kindness reminder, say, you sure you want to send this? Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, and because <clears throat> I think you just reminded me of, um, so there was a podcast I just released uh, with um, what by the time at the time of this recording is with Joseph uh, Michelli, who's just written a book called mm. uh, Stronger Through uh, Adversity, where he talked to mm. 140 different leaders about their experiences and what they've been learning and all this sort of stuff throughout the pandemic. And I mean, it's like a massive undertaking and published it in within about four or five months or something. If you don't know Joseph, then I'll- I'm, No, I, that sounds fascinating. I'd love to see that. I will kind of like, I will hook you up with Joseph because you you guys need to talk because he's got a wealth of experience that hold that, like that yeah. 140 interviews is, a, is a, like almost a database. Wow. Like it would be amazing, I think, for you guys to kind of, uh, to connect and, and chat about that. Wow, that's great. Well, the second example I had was uh, was Roger Burnley, my my old boss at uh, and current boss or current CEO of Asta. And the only reason I, the reason I bring that up is because you get when you're working on top team and you're in it in the thick of it, you get to see you know people's day jobs and what it really looks like and mm -hmm. the, their real attitudes toward customers. Mm -hmm. And Roger would get uh, it's probably way more than it was, but uh, before the pandemic. 300 emails a day from customers. Right. And not all of them were love letters, as mm -hmm. you can imagine. Um, but it takes the time to go through them and really understand them and respond to them and a whole you know action group assigned to, to follow up and make sure the right things happen. And mm -hmm. I think through the pandemic too, uh, watching him make decisions about how we're going to continue to support local communities with the um, Asta Foundation and the giving and and being a real part there when others might see that as a distraction mm -hmm. or you know is that really a priority uh, or not and it, it, it's amazing how many things happen at a senior level and I'm, I'm talking all all big companies yeah. where a decision could be made that's not really customer centric maybe yeah. it's short term profits I mean. Mm -hmm. There's a, what you put on your tech roadmap. Um, yeah. you, you know that, and I think you've talked about that before, of senior buy-in to customer centricity is so important for anything sure. to get done. Mm -hmm. And to, to see that up and close and personal, uh, he's one that I just admire because of that. It, to, it could, took a lot of courage at times to do it. But I think it also kind of speaks to this kind of idea that the other thing that, I, that, that I've noticed, I mean, it's like, you know, people talk about purpose and you know, mm. what, the why of what you do thing and why you do things, but like what we've also kind of seen accelerated throughout this, um, throughout the last few few months, but you know, whether it's because of the pandemic, well, it's because of the pandemic and also because of also a lot of the social unrest and injustice yeah. that we've seen around uh, people and those two things that have collided yes. uh, or actually just kind of amplified, um, you know, the, the calls for business to take a more considered view and a more positive view about what they do and why they do it. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I term that as a, something, I, I think it's a bigger thing than purpose because if purpose fits into that whole, what I call stakeholder experience that could be, includes both your customers and your employees, but also the wider community that, it, that aren't your customers, yes. um, but they are the, your watchers as it were, mm -hmm. you know, they are your, your constituents. And I think that's, it's, you're absolutely right to stay the course on doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do, even when things get tight. I think people just notice that. Well, you know, I saw research kind of coming out at the early kind of stages of the pandemic where people were saying, you know what, customers were watching. Yeah. We're watching brands to see how they treated their customers and their employees and their state and their suppliers. And so, and so it's like, do the right thing because this is crazy time. So do the right thing. Well, and I, I think you even wrote about it this in your article, but um, the I think the pandemic also caused people to get really close to their existing customers. Yeah, and listen, and it wasn't so much about customer acquisition; yeah. it was really about customer closeness, mm. and it, it brought that together. And, and um, I think that's helped quite a bit because it ties you a little bit closer to why you do what you do, and you mm. see it, and you see you know how you're helping people on a regular basis. And so uh, I hope that stays with us. Yeah, and I hope so. I mean, I think what we've actually kind of seen, and I think this is the, the thing around about new habits emerging and stuff, but I think it also something I've been kind of like sort of talking about is, is the, the collapsing of the gap between rhetoric and activity, mm. um, where people like, I remember talking to uh, Nick Meta, who's the CEO of Gainsight uh, a few months ago, and he was like, he's, he's part of this kind of CEO group of like, there's a group of CEOs that are head up SaaS companies. And... Mm. 
when the the pandemic struck and was in, we, I think you were all in the US were in first mm-hmm. phase of shelter in place. We were in our first lockdown, and he was telling me he was like hearing from all these CEOs. They're saying, you know, that thing that we said was important. Mm. Well, now it is. So it's really important. <laughs> so yeah, we're doing the things we said we should be doing. Kind of like we are properly double, doubling down on all that sort of stuff. And it's a bit like yeah, there's sort of like I think what it's really doing is it, it's forced us to get priorities. Uh, kind of like it's really got organized a priority list, as it were. Like you said with as does like yeah. they did in eight years. They did yeah. eight weeks what they, they would plan to do in like eight years or so. Yeah. You know, the other thing was interesting, and it's part of the power of being customer centric. Um, not that we were all the way to where we wanted to be at Asda, but but we started down a journey probably three years ago on becoming more agile and understanding agile and th- yeah. those methods and a digital transformation, as probably many companies did. But that that approach and a shift in the approach really caused us to create a test and learn experiment budget and mm-hmm. experiment processes. And, and we had lots of things in uh, test and we're trying different things. And when the pandemic hit, it really gave an opportunity, like because we had those started, you could get there a lot faster. And mm-hmm. I think of like in the restaurant industry here, casual dining, if they hadn't been playing around and experimenting with um, takeout, mm-hmm. Uh, they were in a much worse position than those that already prototyped it, started it, and yeah. now it was just a matter of stepping on the gas and doing it at a much sure. faster pace. But, but I think that's the the value I think of a customer centric model is mm-hmm. if you've got a test and loan active ecosystem, if something crisis hits, you might have five things there that you could pick from that uh, might be the one you want to step on the gas, and you're not starting from scratch. Yeah, absolutely. So. What else are you kind of like? Um, are you working on kind of right right now, or is there anything else that around this kind of area of kind of customer centricity that you'd like to kind of like highlight or say this is the thing that this is a big thing that's kind of shown up before I kind of ask you to peer into your crystal ball, Andy. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm just a little surprised at the uh, lack of understanding, uh, middle to higher. Mm-hmm. in organizations and uh, I think lack of understanding of definitions and mm-hmm. so something that might sound simple to you because you work in a space of a, the role of a product manager. Mm-hmm. If you don't understand that, um, I've seen a lot of project managers getting put in those roles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those are two very, because they sound alike, Yeah, but they're, but they're two very different things. Mm-hmm. And so and it get, you get two very different outcomes when you do that. So I, I still have a, I think a lot of work to do here on just bringing more understanding of what is what do these roles mean and how does it really work together. Uh, there's, a, it, it, there's a really big push in a lot of companies to go really all the way to the edge on Agile. And yeah. it's, um, that can be more harmful than not. <laughs> yeah. That uh, you, because they don't know how to harmonize the yeah. organization, and so I think uh, you know Daryl Rigsby talks a lot about this. I like following his work. Nick Fine, others. Of uh, there's a more of an understanding happening now that you've got to harmonize the Friday's payroll with invent the future through agile. Yeah, I think you should. Uh, you you should also kind of like you might enjoy talking to um, either Mark Curtis or Olaf Scheibergson of. Um, mm. Uh, Fjord, or they're now Accenture Interactive, and yeah. um, because I spoke to Olaf a wee while ago, and he told me that they've worked with organisations where they take many of the existing executives through a bit of an experiential kind of program, and they oh, kind of run that idea. kind of, and they're a little bit like going. So at the end of every day, they're like, oh, "Should we go for a beer?" And they're like, "No, we just have to go home." I have to go home and I'm going to sit on the couch and just watch kind of TV or go to bed or something. It's just like I'm drained because it's just like it's yeah. it is. I mean, in the true sense of the word, it's like it is a transformative kind of thing yeah. where you start to walk this kind of path if you're not used to it. I, that's what I think is the big misunderstanding. I just don't think senior leaders know how transformative this is. Mm. And it's. Uh, I did speak to Larry Thomas, the head of uh, uh, Accenture Interactive, and yeah. they do a lot of the organizational support help to transition. And he sees that as well of the just lack of um, lack of, because we didn't grow up in it. I mean, a lot of people didn't grow up in it. Sure, sure, sure. So, Andy, can, let's kind of look to the future a little bit. I mean, yeah. um, what do you think is the 
what's the, you know, think about the future of service and experience I means there's kind of like timelines and things have accelerated so much kind of over the last kind of few months. But what do you see kind of coming up that you think these are some of the next big hurdles that we might need to kind of um, get over or these are the next, the new vectors that we might need to be kind of factor into our thinking? Well, I think that I think the pressure to um, to tie customer experience initiatives to real business results yeah. uh, is going to accelerate because there's been a lot of money being dumped into customer experience areas. Mm -hmm. But uh, some of those may not have been guided by working on a problem that can be scaled. Um, mm -hmm at a level that shows up in the results. And so I think we're gonna see some pressure on on that side of it. Um, and I think it's gonna require finance and the finance organizations to rethink how they measure success. Mm -hmm. uh, still too much of it's measured on ROI mm -hmm. and instead of lifetime value or sure. you know some other things like that. So I, I think there's gonna have to be a bit more attention put into how do you measure customer experience and rethink how that gets scorecarded um, for things to get done, because I don't think the answer is going to be they have to have faster ROIs, uh, because that's just not the way it works. And yeah. so, um, but I've not seen it yet get through to the board level of how do you value that work in a way that's beyond just an ROI. Yeah, I mean, I think it's. It, um, I think about it from a perspective of it's almost like back to basics. It's almost a bit like I say to people. You know, um, I asked them, so what's your experience strategy? And then mm. the second part of the question is, and how does, how does that support or, or enable um, the business to achieve its own corporate or strategic objectives? Mm. And many are, people are confounded by that because they haven't almost made that link. And yeah. I said to them, I said, I think there's each business has like, you know, five key drivers and that yeah. is your ability to attract customers your ability to convert customers mm -hmm. you know how much you know how the the buying process in terms of how customers buy from you how often they buy and how much they buy from you and then also how much it costs you to serve them to mm -hmm. do all that and those are the five things that drive that are almost the, the chassis upon which most businesses sit yep and if your initiatives aren't tied to the improvement of one of those things, then you're sort of kind of floating around unanchored, really. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, we we were taking down a few initiatives that looked like they were interesting, but they were only interesting to early adopters. Yeah, exactly. And, and it didn't connect into anything else. And so, so one of the things, Adrian, I've been thinking a lot about is the power of simplifying things to the singular. I think the COVID did a lot of simplification mm. to priorities and such, but but what I have found is there's about five key questions that simplify things down that will improve the outcome opportunity for these customer initiatives to be much more impactful. And the first one, they, and they sound so simple, but and they are, but they're yeah. hard. Yeah. So, yep, what's the single biggest problem you're trying to solve? Wow. Okay, well, not your problem, the customer's problem. Yeah, exactly. The customers see it as a problem. Second, what's the single biggest outcome you're trying to achieve? An outcome being an outcome that changes their lives, not an outcome that's just an objective for you. And then what's the single biggest barrier? Mm -hmm. uh, we get so lost on so many barriers, but it's really the elephant in your room you're looking for and that mm -hmm. no one wants to talk about. That's mm -hmm. what you want to identify. Uh, and then how, what's one single measure you can use? And you know, one single measure we used in ASA was, is we call it customer promoter score because it's yeah. like an MPS, but it's real customers. That was put in everybody's incentive. Mm -hmm. One metric was added to the bonus scheme. Mm -hmm. That absolutely changed behavior on customer centricity mm -hmm. and did that about three years ago. And I think that was you know phenomenal way to use one measure that'll start. It's not perfect, but it does remind and keep it front and center. And then lastly, what's one thing you can do every single day? Mm -hmm. And if you're not in the day-to-day -day routine and you're working on customer experience stuff, it's it's it gets lost. It can't be something you look at once every month yeah. or something like that. Is there something you could do to improve the customer experience every single day? that everyone can do. And you, you get those kind of five things working, then it, it start, starts to really change the game. I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think it kind of it highlights that whole thing around kind of like, this is about, um, it's about mindset and about yeah. creating discipline and turning yep. discipline into habit. And then yes. habit kind of then kind of drives kind of everything you can like kind of do. So it's not a function and it's not just a thing mm. that you do. It's a thing that there's a way that you are and the way that you It's think. a way that you are, yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Perfect. So there's all of that out there. Mm -hmm. And then kind of people are going like, 
shit, where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> and so, Andy, from your experience, have you, what would be your best advice if somebody's kind of saying like, oh, I'm in this leadership position, I really want to kind of like um, make an improvement or start kind of like, you know, really kind of like make, taking some strides about improving their service experience to deliver to their customers. I mean, what would be your best advice? Well, if they haven't done it already, the very first place to start in my mind is go get your um, customer promoter score, net promoter score, and look at the dissatisfiers and try to find out what's driving that. Because if you can if you can eliminate, I know it's low hanging fruit, mm -hmm. but if you can eliminate dissatisfiers by working on where the friction is or the hassle factors, mm -hmm. they pay off much faster than sure. trying to get to the top end of the NPS and getting them you know, to share about a new experience. And so I think number one is eliminate dissatisfiers. That's yeah. easy data to get. Mm -hmm. And so it, it should be your, your first place to go because it will get you the quickest results. Yeah. Uh, it's you can't live there forever, but if you're just starting out, boy, I would be all over the dissatisfiers, and because that's the that's your fastest growth opportunity. To go fix. Um, absolutely, so. I absolutely uh, agree. And, and actually, if you want to get really dirty, mm -hmm. then go visit the people in your complaints department. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, or, or go go sit uh, at the desk of a call center and put on one of the headsets and listen. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> you really want to be frightened. Yeah, exactly. If you can, I mean, that's the. That, I think for me, that is the that's the down and dirty part of the work, but that's the that's the necessary part of the work. Oh yeah, because it's like I remember speaking to a guy called Jerry McGovern, and he said, you know, what? from he said from my perspective, he says like. A lot of customer experience is both just cleaning and sweeping. Yep. Yep. And we and undervalue said, that so much because we don't want to deal with it. And yeah. unfortunately, a lot of that customer service area has been, um, it links up into top, into the top in an operational sense. And probably the incentives are how fast can you get them off the phone? Yeah. You know, not, not were they thrilled with the experience. Sure. Perfect. Thank you. That's great advice. Yeah. So, Annie, one final thing. Mm -hmm. Um, we talked about the, you know, as you know, I published this book called Punk CX and I've been doing mm -hmm. these two questions at the end, which are like word brand association questions as a piece of ongoing social research, I call them. And mm -hmm. so my first question is, what one word would you use, or one or two words rather, would you use to describe a more punk approach to customer experience? Wow, that's a tough one. But uh, I tell you, there's only one word that comes to mind for me and that's uh -huh. the word audacity uh, I love it you know what that's the name of the, the, the that's the name also of the the software that I use for editing the podcasts oh you're kidding <laughs> oh, there you go I didn't know that of course <laughs> well you know you look at people that are changing the game and it's not necessarily they're smarter or uh, more clever you know or more experienced sometimes you just have audacity to do it yeah. it's like and you say oh the audacity of that person to raise their hand and take that on you know how dare they and that's what i think that's what i think punk is all about nice and so what sort of um company or brand do you think epitomizes that type of ethos uh well i i have to go back to maybe because it's recency kind of thing with sarah and what they did at next door that kindness reminders just blow blows my mind uh, that's take some audacity because I'm sure there was a lot of naysayers that's like ah, you can't do that and you know what if we get it wrong and all the things you get into and it's like no we're doing it and so that's that's audacity to me nice I love it so Andy I thank you for all of that I want to say first of all uh, congrats on the um, joining the Mm. Sam M. Walton College of Business is yep. the head up the, the leader of the customer centric leadership initiative um, mm -hmm. and and all the work that you do with the big quest and everything else. And finally, just for sharing your time and your insight and your experience with us today, that's been super cool. Oh, thank you, Adrian. And I tell you, keep going on the podcast because there's not enough voices out there that understand the difference between you know, a, a theoretical model of customer centricity in the real, real world. So I think you get some real world advice from the practitioners and thought leaders you've got on and you hold them account to that. So uh, keep doing it because it's, uh, it's one I listen to every day. Thank you very much, man. That's, that's, that's great to hear. Well, that was cool. I hope you enjoyed it. I did, and I always do actually, because I always learn something new when I speak to some of these amazing kind of people. And it's always something new that I can incorporate into my writing, speaking workshops, and other sort of advisory work that I do.
Now, if you're interested in learning about any of that sort of stuff, then you can find out more about how I work with clients over at adrianswinsco.com. One final thing before I go, please consider heading over to iTunes or Spotify or whichever podcast platform you choose to use and do leave a review. Every little helps, as they say. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for listening and do tune in again soon. All the very best. Cheers. Bye.